Welcome back everyone to the second rendition in my series about Deeds of the Saxons by Wiedekind of Koi. And let's recap, recap real quick where we left off. In this map you can see the Eastern Realm, that's the East Frankian Empire. And Heinrich has just been crowned king, succeeding Conrad I, king of East Francia. So now having been crowned king, let's dive right back into the story and see what he goes on to do. Heinrich immediately goes to work, makes Bavaria and Swabia vassals to him. He settles a West Frankian succession feud by defeating King Charles or Karl the Simple. He also gains Lorraine through marriage and that's a big thing if we take a look at this map here. Lorraine is the area, as I said on the last video, called Lotharingian here. So pretty much the area west of the Rhine River. He gains influence over through marriage, that's a big advantage, a big victory for him, also considering the later years in Europe. Alright, so his wife Matilde, who descends from Saxon leader Wiederkind, who as I mentioned last episode, a big figure in German, Germanic history, bears him four sons, the second oldest of which is Otto, who would go on to become Otto the Great, Otto the I of East Francia. Hungarian raids resume at this time, during which an Avar leader was caught. Avar is a synonym for Hungarians. The Avars are a Hungarian type tribe at this time. The Hungarians want to ransom their leader, which is a pretty common practice. Pretty much whenever in warfare a leader, a big figure, a nobleman is caught, the opposing party will retrieve him through some gift in terms of money, goods or land. But Heinrich refuses and instead negotiates a peace deal during which he pays tribute to the Hungarians. In this peacetime, Heinrich focuses on strengthening his kingdom, building castles and reforming. During this time, a big barbarian army is assembled. Barbarian needs to be mentioned in quotations here because the barbarians in this case are really not too different from the Saxons, Saxons themselves. They're simply just like in terms of the Romans who would also always refer to barbarians. They're simply not Saxons themselves and maybe not Christianized to the same extent. This barbarian army is beaten by an outnumbered royal force led by one of Heinrich's vassals. This victory, in which the opponent is almost entirely wiped out, becomes a big icon of divine support for the Saxons. The king's son Otto, who would go on to become emperor, marries Edith, an English princess, sister of Athelstan and daughter of King Edward. This is a big event in European history, of course, because the king's son, who would then become emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, German royal family marries into the English royal family and as I said his wife is the princess in England, sister of King Athelstan who would also be remembered as one of the first kings of all of England so this is a big marriage between these two royal families. Otto has two immensely important children with her, son Leodolf and daughter Leodgard who would marry Conrad the Red later on. Conrad the Red and Otto are going to be two primary characters in my next video on book two of Deeds of the Saxons. Now let's go back to the story of Heinrich and his final struggle. After consulting with his nobles, he refuses the Hungarians' usual demand for tribute after nine years of peace. The Saxons feel protected by God and confident that he will assist them against the pagan Avars. Predictably, the Hungarians invade Francia with two armies. Heinrich defeats the first army. But the second army flees at the Battle of Viade. This battle is a predecessor to a much more important later on battle that we're gonna cover in another part of this series. But what basically happened was that the Hungarians were lured in by a split weaker force of Heinrichs. But upon realizing that Heinrichs entire army was present and Heinrich had very scary big heavy cavalry uh, at this battle and the Hungarians couldn't really deal with that as they on their light horse archers were much better equipped against infantry soldiers. They decided to flee and pretty much got away unscathed. Thereafter Heinrich is proclaimed as the emperor and the father of the fatherland by his soldiers. This is a big event and a very important distinction that we're going to be talking about later on as well. 
He, descri he is described as an enormously intelligent, popular, generous and strong king of international recognition by Widukind. He wins one final war against the smaller Danish king, but due to sickness he crucially does not go on the journey for Rome, where usually kings of the empire before and after him who accomplished greatness would travel to Rome in order to be crowned emperor officially by the Pope. Sensing his imminent death, he establishes a new law of succession pretty much on his deathbed. He names his son Otto, who is crucially not the eldest, as successor. Otto becomes king and keeps the entire realm together. His other sons uh, receive shares of treasures and goods. But this is a big break from Frankish tradition, where in the Carolingian era, just like it happened with Karl the Great, Charlemagne's realm, it was usually split between the sons. But in this case, Otto, who wasn't even the eldest, got all the land for himself to rule over. I quote Widukind here, A big and wide empire, not inherited from his fathers, but acquired on his own and awarded to him solely by God. This was, end quote, this was the understanding the Saxons had of themselves at this time. And it is a very important point to realize, talking about Heinrich's legacy, because the Saxons felt like the empire and thereby the title of emperor was awarded to them by God, not by the Pope, simply through, well, the fortune that God brought over the people of Saxony. This new law makes civil war less likely in that, as opposed to before, one person keeps all the lands, so the land does not get split up and the sons are not encouraged to wage war against each other that much. As the first non-Frank, non-Carolingian Frank on the throne, Heinrich is considered the founder of the German state. You could consider him something of a founding father in a sense. The idea of the emperor not as a title awarded by the Pope, but by the troops in the field after an extraordinary military achievement emerges. This is a big point of discussion that is going to be brought up more often later on in history when the debates between popes and kings get more and more heated. Of course, the official title is awarded by the pope to the king and after he gets crowned by the pope himself, he becomes emperor. But many people argue that it is God himself who chooses who becomes emperor, not the pope. So more those royalists, uh, as you could say, they argue from a perspective that God brings fortune to the king, mostly in form of a big um, military victory, so that the troops in the field then decide the, this king is a special one, he is the protector of our people, of our faith, and they call him out as an emperor, just like it was the case with Heinrich here. Today, Heinrich is not considered an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, as he was never crowned by the Pope. However, many of his subjects and troops, as well as many following monarchs, regard him as one. There is definitely a separate idea of a German emperor at this point who is not bound to the church. The title of Holy Roman Empire is not a thing at this point in time. It's simply the emperor. And many people felt like the title of the emperor is earned by the emperor and given to him by God and not the Pope. So I hope that you found this episode at all interesting. If you did, please feel free to discuss or add to what I said down in the comments below. And also please look forward to me covering books two and three of the Deeds of the Saxons in my upcoming videos. Until then, stay safe out there, have a good time, and I'll see you next time.